there was a lady who saw this little old man sitting on his front porch, rocking in his rocking chair, always seems to be so happy. She finally went over to him and said, I can't help but notice you are always smiling, always in a good mood. Tell me what is your secret for such a long, happy life. He said, that is easy. I, sm I smoke three packs of cigarettes every day. I eat nothing but junk food and I never exercise. <laughs> she said, that's amazing. How old are you? He said, 26. <laughs> Dear friends, in Jesus Christ, the terminology of today's gospel has made it its very made it its way into our daily speech. We often speak of someone turning the other cheek or going the extra mile. Our initial reaction to hearing today's gospel might be to think that it is not very practical. Yes, it is wonderful ideal, but it is impossible to achieve. It is good to have such a noble text in, from uh, among our scriptures, but we can, we can hardly be expected to take it seriously. The kind of reaction may point more to our own unease with this challenging text than to any problem with the message itself. At the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus called for a virtue that goes deeper than that of scribes and Pharisees, a way of life that was a step beyond what the Jewish law required. Today's Gospel is the fullest statement of this deeper virtue that Jesus calls for. The Old Testament stipulation of an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth was enlightened effort at the time to put some limits on the extent to which people could re retaliate for an injury inflicted on them. The tendency towards disproportionate retaliation had become the norm, several eyes for one eye and several teeth for one tooth. The teaching of Jesus goes beyond the law's attempt to limit retaliation by calling for no retaliation at all. There is to be a, no room for vengeance on a personal level among Jesus' followers. Jesus not only calls on his followers not to take vengeance on those who do them harm, but to go further and to love the enemy. He thereby calls for a love that is comprehensively inclusive. As one commentator on this passage puts it, who else is, to, is left to love after one he has loved the enemy? The love that Jesus calls for is not a feeling, but finds expression in active service. We might Think of a parable of the Good Samaritan, in which the Samaritan renders loving service to the injured Jew, who would have been regarded by the Samaritan as an enemy. Jesus declares that love of the enemy will also find expression in prayer for the enemy, as when Jesus asked his father 
to forgive those who were responsible for his crucifixion. We all have a tendency to restrict the scope of our service of others and of our prayer for others. We tend to focus our love on those for whom we have strong feelings of warmth and affection. This is natural, but in the language of today's gospel, it is not exceptional. Jesus calls on us to stretch beyond those that our love would naturally embrace. The gospel reading does indeed stretch beyond, stretches as human wisdom might argue against allowing ourselves to be stretched in this way. In loving the enemy, are we not leaving ourselves open to be being taken advantage of? Is it not the case that charity begins at home? Yet, as St. Paul reminds us in today's second reading, the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. The wisdom of God is of a different order to human wisdom. God's wisdom is revealed above all in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus forgave the disciple who denied him. He washed the feet of his betrayer. He died for all, including those who executed him. Therein lies the wisdom of God, and that is what Jesus puts before us in today's gospel, the wisdom of a love that excludes nobody. There is a yawning gulf between God's wisdom and what passes for human wisdom. As the prophet Isaiah declares, God's ways are not our ways and God's thoughts are not our thoughts. That is why we find the message of today's gospel so shocking and so unreasonable. We might be tempted to think that this call to perfection really only applies to a special group within the church, those who are, who are in the monastery or whatsoever. Yet in the gospel, Jesus is calling on all his disciples to move in the direction of God's ways, to reflect in the way we relate to others, the God whose love causes the rain to, to f fall on honest and dishonest, and his love, God's love, causes the sun to rise on bad people and as well as a good people. Mercy without measure is the obligation of every Christian. Jesus pays us the compliment of asking us to be perfect as God, even in the age of chronic imperfection.